Welcome back everybody. I am your host, Stone Up the Hero Type, and I've decided to revamp how to RP1 since the last time I started doing this. They made a major update to the game, making most of what I had put out pretty much useless. So we're just going to start back over and this will be the introduction video to the series. Now I turn off reverting flights and there's a mistake to that which I'll go over in a little bit. But don't do that. You do want to turn off the scat sand contract thing and contract configure. Uh, mostly because RP1 already has some and it causes a weird glitchy bugginess later in the game. So uncheck that when you start the game and just get it out of the way. But other than that, we're going to be playing on stock difficulty. Normal, just not hard mode, not easy mode, just normal stock, everything else. And the big focus on this like introduction episode is going to be kind of going over some of the initial changes. Won't be going over all of them, obviously. That will be a little bit later in the series. Most of what I'm going to go over is still viable from the original episode zero, but there are some differences. Anyways, with that out of the way, let's go ahead and hop over to the KSC and let's get started. Now, when the game first loads, you're going to have all of these menus and we're going to kind of go over them all individually, but we're going to start with Kerbal Construction Time. Keep in mind, Kerbal Construction Time is actually now built in to RP1, so you don't need the mod by itself. Just having the RP1 pack gives you all of this stuff. Now again, I like to play with my vehicle assembly and my uh, space plane hangar split. The pros is you can build things, you know, at the same time, planes and rockets. The cons are you have to upgrade them individually. So if you're not going to be doing any planes, then just keep it stock normal. Have the R&D and the VAB, but it's totally up to you. And like usual, you always want to throw your first point in the VAB. Now we're going to hop over to the Mission Control Building and grab the very first two contracts, starting parts, and the first launch. Now every so often, the starting parts thing will bug out. Um, you'll see it load up here in a second. And it's under milestones, and it's just the very, very first thing you see is first launch and blow it is unlock starting parts. You'll see a couple of other contracts down here, and don't worry about these ones just yet. Uh, those will come a little bit later. You want to get that starting parts in the first launch going, as the very first thing you're going to do is launch your very first rocket. If starting parts doesn't auto-complete, just back out of mission control, and that usually makes it complete itself. Sometimes you have to go into the R&D building and toggle back out. There's a few different ways to get this to work, and every so often you may just have to start a new game. Luckily, this glitch happens like right at the beginning, so it's not a big deal. Now, as you see here, the contract completed itself, which means we officially unlocked our starting parts. That's what we want. Another way you can check this is by going into the R&D building, and you'll see the first two or three tabs have unlocked. Now, the one above it, leave that alone. You don't want it. But as you see here, there is a lot of stuff with RP1RO when it comes to the tech tree, especially compared to stock KSP. Now again, these are the non-RPO parts I was telling you about. These are parts that aren't really designed to be used in Realism Overhaul. I would recommend not unlocking that because it just kind of clutters the vehicle assembly menus and it's, it's not worth having them. But anyways, we're going to back out of that and let's go ahead and get ready to build our very first rocket. We're going to go over some of the in-depth VAB stuff and designing the first launch vehicle, which if I remember to, I'll go ahead and I'll leave a craft file in the description if you just want to download that. It should be all the base RP1 stuff, so you should be able to load it and kind of see what I did. But with that, let's go over to the VAB. Now, those of you who've played Kerbal Space Program, stock or not, you'll recognize what a lot of this stuff does. But one of the first changes is experimental mode, this little icon up in the corner. You see how it will toggle everything from being, you know, lit up and grabbable to not being able to use it? Experimental mode is parts you have not purchased or unlocked yet. Now, when researching things, you're actually able to check them out in experimental mode if you want to kind of plan ahead. But we'll kind of get into that a little bit later. Now, unfortunately, my editor Redux is malfunctioning, so 
none of this stuff is working correctly none of my hotkeys work normally if you have that issue if you open up the editor extension menu and you just kind of reset it you'll get your shortcut x and c and, and whatever keys back mine seems to just be not cooperating but we're gonna go ahead and move on from that now like the other episode um we talked about simulations and crash but there's no longer crash the simulation is also built into rp1 which is another big change i recommend you play around with this menu um, it has a lot of similar things to crash it's free to use you can actually test rockets in the future. You got to be careful when you do that though, because if you accidentally close the game instead of reverting back to the VAB, it can make all kinds of weird things happen. So just tread lightly when using simulation, but we're going to actually start building our very first rocket. Now, like usual, there are guidance systems, procedural parts and stuff like that. This is a RPO usable guidance system that allows you to control up to 20 tons. It's a meter in diameter. This can actually be really useful in early sounding rockets. I personally like to use 1.25 meters for my first major sounding rocket, but feel free to use these if you want. They actually work a lot better than they used to. I used to have issues with them in, before the update, but they actually work really well. They have the same basic structure as a procedural avionics when it comes to, you know, the antennas and all that stuff. Uh, the only difference is you can't make them bigger or smaller. We're going to be focusing on the WAC Corporal units though. Now, with the telemetry units, you don't get control, but for the first rockets, where we're going, we don't need control. I'm going to get sued for that. Anyways, there's a 0.3 and a 0.38 diameter like before. Um, as usual, I like to use the 0.3 diameter purely because the first rocket you build I can't justify the fuel use for a 0.38 meter. It makes it too stubby. You want a longer, skinnier, more aerodynamic rocket. I mentioned this in the last video. Procedural parts are a huge thing when it comes to RP-1. So you want to play around with this. You can change the shape, the size, the diameter. You, you, you can basically do almost whatever you want with these things. You can use them as structural pieces. There's, there's a lot that goes into it. We're just gonna use this to make a nose cone and a base. There are other procedural stuff like wings and there's actually structure parts you can use, um, as well as procedural SRBs, which we're not gonna actually touch right now. We're just gonna use the Tiny Tim because I prefer that, but you can actually use procedural SRBs if you wanna make like a custom booster for rockets at any point in time. Now I have the procedural engines mod installed on this particular file for a different reason. We're not gonna be using that. So disregard those extra engines. We're gonna be using the Aero B engine. Now the Aero B engine is a pressure fed engine, which means we need a high pressure tank. And one of the changes actually with real fuels and the whole overall update is if it's not the right kind of tank, it won't even let you add the fuel. Like if you see here, I can look at the tank UI, but I can't actually add any fuel. But once we switch it over to a high pressure tank and come in and out of the menu, we should be able to add fuel to it. Sometimes being able to you know take the engine on and off the tank, it would allow you to do that. It just doesn't work that way anymore. It's, I think it's to help you know not accidentally put the wrong type of tank on whatever engine you're using but it's kind of like a safety net. Now we're gonna force it into letting us use a non-pressurized tank and we're gonna get this big red, not pressurized thing here. That means this rocket won't work. It just, it won't. You have to have a high pressure tank, so might as well use them. Now in the past, you used to be able to take that nose cone tank and make it non-high pressure to save a little bit of weight since the high pressure tanks do weigh more. Unfortunately, the game got smart and you can't do that anymore. It just won't use the fuel. It won't actually add to your delta V margins. So if you want to have fuel in the upper tank, you have to make it a high pressure tank. Honestly, at that point, I would just make the base tank a little bit longer and leave this one empty. But as you see here, I'm going to actually try and put fuel in it and it's going to fight me on it. And then when I add fuel, it's not going to change my delta V in any positive way or increase my burn time. So that is one of the little 
things about the update that I wanted to let you guys, you know, make sure you guys were aware of, I guess. Now, there still may be some engines you can kind of cheese, but I haven't sat down and gone through every single one. So I'm just going to go ahead and adjust the nose cone until I like it. And then we're going to add the experiments and move on to the rest of the build. Now, like usual, your first experiments are always going to typically be the thermometer and the barometer. Because they're small, they'll fit, and you're not going to recover these typically, so... You want something that can transmit most of its data before you get smacked into, you know, the earth or the water or wherever the rocket ends up. Now, again, I'm having a little bit of an issue with my editor Redux, so this did fight me for a second. I'm going to speed through a little bit of this real quick, and then we'll get back to the rest of the build. Now, you may notice that I am trying to center these the best I can. You want these to be as balanced as possible because even a little bit out of adjustment can cause an issue. Now when I did this trick last time someone asked me how I did it. If you turn on snap and you hold down shift and you pull into the rocket it will actually bring it up and over just enough to where it's sitting out the face of the telemetry units and it makes sure they're both nice and even. That's just a little trick that I use. But we're going to move on to procedural wings. Now I went over procedural wings and the last one. And a lot of that stuff still stands. Um, one of the biggest changes, though, is you can still use, like, the T, G, H keys to kind of, you know, move the stuff around. But if you hit the J menu, you get these cool little arrows. So instead of, you know, doing, like, the drag, drag around, which some people prefer, I do not. Um, you can use the J menu and actually use the little arrows to kind of uh, adjust everything with a little more precision. Um, I used the you know, drag keys to start the wings, but then we're gonna go into the J menu and actually do our, like, our final touches. Now here are the arrows I was talking about. Um, the blue ones are the, the leading surface and etc. The yellow ones are the actual length of whatever side of the wing you are. Green will make it longer or shorter. Play around and get used to this. Now, like before, we're going to build a set of wings that is purely designed to hold aerodynamic drag at the bottom of the rocket to prevent it from tipping over, because with FAR and RO, that is a huge issue. Like always, you want the center of mass to be over the center of lift. That's in just rocket design in general. Uh, typically, I use a tri-wing or three-wing design on this, uh, mostly because it saves weight and actually gives you more delta V. We're going to skip out the designing stuff on this. I'll kind of touch on how the recolor tool works. But we're going to go ahead and pull up the comm and center of lift menus. And I'm going to adjust the wings and make them a little bit smaller to save mass. And it's okay to make them smaller as long as the center of lift stays below the center of mass. I cannot stress that fact enough. You see here, I'm going to bring them in and it's going to make it go a little high. Then we're going to stretch them out and make some adjustments. Feel free to play with this and just fine tune it. You have the little uh, bar menus you can use for very small adjustments. But once I get something I'm happy with, I'm going to go ahead and keep them. And these wings should actually give us enough aerodynamic stability, as well as shave off enough mass to give us plenty of delta V. We may even be able to break the Karma line with this, which after the update, using an Aero B to break the Karma line is very difficult. Um, this particular rocket should be able to do it. Um, it does it in crash tests, but we'll move on from that and talk about that later. Now we're going to speed up here for just a quick second because I was having issues getting the ring decoupler to work properly for me. But since the Aero B still needs some kind of ollage, it needs a kick stage. Like before, we're going to use the Tiny Tim Booster and just give it that initial kick to get it off the ground as we ignite and decouple the rocket from the little booster. One of the biggest changes, the Aero B used to take a lot longer to spool up. So I used to stage the Aero B and the Tiny Tim together. It's actually better if you have the Tiny Tim and Launch Clap staged together and the Aero B and the Decoupler staged together because it will actually give you a little bit more Delta V in the long run. And I tested this about a hundred times and not one time did that Aero B fail to ignite. So as you see that's kind of how I have it staged right here. We're going to real quickly do some designing on this rocket and I'll be right back with you. So I went ahead and designed this and kind of gave it a little bit of a personal flair. The way you could do all this stuff is by using the recolor tool, which is in the menu when you right click right here. And then you can go through and, you know, change the color of certain aspects of the rocket. This is one of those things that you kind of need to play around with to fully understand it. Um, 
there's different metallics and stuff like that. So take a little bit of time and kind of play around with this menu. It can really make your rockets look a lot better aesthetically and give them your own personal touch. That being said, I want to go over to the tracking station real quick and talk about a few things that I never brought up in my last video. Now, like with stock KSP, there's multiple launch sites you can visit. Um, just with RO, there are a lot of them. I guess technically it's RSS. A few things to keep in mind is one, when you switch between launch sites, you have to independently upgrade them as well as independently build launch pads, which is something we didn't really talk about in this video because I did cover it pretty extensively in my other first episode of How to RP1. And again, this was more of kind of like a generalized update of what has changed. I just realized I never mentioned any of this in my old playthrough, so I figured I'd bring it up now. But if you want to do like a Russian only launch site or, you know, launch exclusively from Japan, you totally can. I wouldn't recommend, especially if this is your first time playing, trying to manage two different launch sites. It, it is kind of a pain. But later as you get through it, if you want to do more of a role playing aspect, using multiple launch sites in like the same country is kind of a cool thing. Anyways, I just wanted to touch on that real fast. Let's go ahead and get back to the rest of the video. So now that we have a rocket that we, we built and we're happy with it, I went ahead and I put two of them in queue because you always want to have something building if possible. Now I already tested this extensively and I've ran it through multiple simulations and stuff and I got it exactly how I wanted it. It's one of the key rules, you want to test the crap out of your crafts, especially if you're new, abuse that simulation thing. It is one of the best tools you can use when it comes to RO. Get a good feel for what you're doing. And I'm gonna end the episode here to try to keep it short. When we come back and do the very first official chapter one, we will be launching this rocket, going over all the stuff that that entails, and getting straight to sounding rockets, and then going on from there. Once again, this was just kind of a recap episode for the things that has been changed since the last chapter one. I'll link that video at the end of this. That will go a lot more in depth on a lot of stuff like using crash and simulations. So go check that out if you have any further questions about the introduction to RP1. But with that, I want to thank you guys for stopping by. If you enjoyed the video and the content, feel free to give it a like. If you want to feel see more, Feel free to subscribe. I haven't figured out how to do outros yet, so uh, I hope I see you guys next time in the official chapter one of How to RP1.